happy holidays, everyone. We're just one day away from Christmas Eve, and we're going strong here at the Shal. Everyone showing up for their practice is beautiful. I, I love this time of year to hear everybody breathing and all the group energy is like a little bit heightened. Um, so we're continuing our studies of the kosha. Our book is Light on Life, and we are on chapter four this week. Um, just a little review, the koshas are the layers of who we are in the yoga philosophy. We believe that we want to integrate these layers and also keep them clean and vibrant so that the atman, the essence of who we are, the soul, can shine through. So the first uh, kosha that we studied was Anumai Kosha, which is the outermost layer of who we are, our physical body. We enter yoga through Anumai Kosha through the asana practice and try to refine our health and the rest of our koshas through that particular first one. And then the second kosha, which we studied the last couple weeks, my favorite kosha to study, or one of my favorites, is Pranamai Kosha. Prana being our energy, our life force. So we talked about how important it is for our health to have this, this vibrant energy. And yoga is one of the few places that's actually a practice where we can come and charge our batteries and, and energize ourselves. And then last week, we um, continued our studies of uh, Pranamaya Kosha and talked about actually as well setting intention um, with our energy and um, raising the vibration, not just for ourselves, but for a community, for a family, uh, for a planet. So we had a beautiful lighting of candles last week for, um, for intention on bringing our, our holistic humankind energy up. So this week, we're in chapter four, and we're on to the third kosha. So we're moving inward, remember. So, so what is the kosha we're studying this week? Mana Good job. Mana my kosha. So what does mana mean? What's the English translation for mana? The mind. So this is the part of ourself that is our intellect, that is our mind, that is our brain. Um, it's what we put into it. It's our thinking. It's our understanding of things. And uh, we realize more and more with all this beautiful research that's coming out in, in science, psychology, and now neuropsychology, how much we are the, in the driver's seat of our brain as well. And, and um, so much is what we put into it and how we train the brain. And um, again, it's, it's something that I personally love to study because I think it sort of gets forgotten because our, our unconscious mind is always at play, always working. And sometimes we're completely unaware of what the mind is thinking and where the mind is going. And yoga, again, is this beautiful place to keep your mind beautiful and healthy because it's the place that we come, this rectangle piece of plastic or this floor that we come to where we actually observe the mind. And we look at the mind and we see like, what is in the mind? What's rolling around in there? What are we putting in the mind? Um, you know, if, if you saw a beautiful movie last night, you might actually come to your yoga mat today and be filled with thoughts of our ideas about that movie that you saw. You know, if you're reading right now a beautiful book like Light on Life by BSK Iyengar, you might find yourself like having thoughts about something he said and thinking deeper about it or changing a behavior because of it. It's what we put into the mind. You know, it's what we choose to, to have in the mind. So yoga becomes for us um, this place where we can be the observer and see where the mind is going. I like to compare it to when, for example, maybe you're driving your car. When you're driving your car, you're, you're driving your car, but the mind is doing all different things. So without even realizing it, you might be thinking about work the day before. You might be thinking about a meeting you have. You might be thinking about something a friend said, something you forgot to do. Sometimes. Um, we might be having a thought of something negative that happened that was just kind of rolling around in our brain. And you know how the brain sometimes can make something negative even bigger, or take it down to even a deeper level of uh, darkness or whatever. The brain has that ability, right? So, but sometimes we're, we're in this state where we're so unconscious that our mind is even doing that. So, um, so that is where the brain is a lot of the time. Some statistic I heard years ago said that we're either forward or backwards 80% of the time. So I'm either thinking about later today or thinking about yesterday or 
or years ago um, in my daily life, you know. So the idea of yoga, and Iyengar said this so beautifully in his book, is this is really meant to become for us our meditation. And meditation for me, I love to take the Tibetan translation of that and say it's the place where we train our minds. It's mind training. So I'm training my mind to what? on my yoga mat or when I meditate, what am I training my mind to do? Be present. Be present. You know, just be present in this moment to actually use my, um, my mind to come back to where I am right now instead of being over here or back there. And, uh, and this, of course, for us is a very powerful thing. So if you do Ashtanga long enough, what you'll find is you do so many Chaturangas in Ashtanga, you will find that you've actually strengthened your body that you strengthen your arm muscles, your shoulder muscles, your back muscles, hopefully your core, right? Because you do it over and over and over. And just when you think there's no more chaturangas, there's more chaturangas. And you realize that where you started physically, it shifted after one year, two years, five years. You're feeling strong and light in this pose. Well, the truth of it is with yoga, we're doing the exact same thing with your brain. Although we can't see it, you are training your mind. Even in Chaturanga, I use this as an example because for Ashtangis, it's kind of our meditation home base. Even if your mind had wandered somewhere else like to blueberry pancakes for breakfast. When you're in Chaturanga, usually it's, it's a challenging asana for us to hold, so it holds the mind a little bit better, right? We say the eight limbs, one of the limbs is dharana, which means to hold. And what we're trying to hold is our mind. We're trying to hold it right here. So we use this body frame in Chaturanga to hold the mind and focus the mind to be here in this breath, in this asana. And the same as it makes my body stronger, it makes my mind stronger to be able to hold the mind to where I want the mind to be and to train it to not run around, run around, but bring it back to where I am right now, which is actually one of the most powerful things that we can train ourselves to do, right, is to control our own thinking and direct our own mind. Um, and so the yoga practice for us becomes this beautiful practice in moving meditation where the mind wanders off somewhere and we bring it back to the breath we bring it back to the pose we're on and the better we get at that the better we get at that the more we take our yoga practice off our mats right i always say to people it is the one thing that you do not for the sake of doing it. So I always say yoga is not a destination. There's no destination triangle pose. There's no destination headstand. All these things that we do, these asanas, these yoga poses that we do are meant to um, enrich our lives. The, the, um, the destination is just the journey. It's the showing up and how me doing this yoga practice is gonna make me a better partner to someone. It's gonna make me a better um, friend to Jennifer. It's gonna make me um, a more compassionate person out there in the world with what's going on. Yoga makes me better at, at everything else that I do. So the idea of becoming strong in my physical body, that's good because I need a healthy physical body. But this training I do with my mind becomes a thing that I take into every single corner of my life. It is so powerful, and yet it sometimes is a thing that we forget about, right? So I um, recited one of my favorite poems on Sunday I want to share with our community on the internet, which is a poem by Hafiz, a uh, Sufi poet. It's called Dropping Keys. The small man builds cages for everyone he knows, while the sage who has to duck his head while the moon is low keeps dropping keys all night long for the beautiful, rowdy prisoners. I chose to recite this poem on Sunday with this conference because to me it's such a beautiful, symbolic um, metaphor for what we're trying to do by making our minds, in my opinion, a, a beautiful place. You know, our minds can either be uh, kind of crazy and stressful and, and nutty, or our minds can be absolutely beautiful. So the poem starts off by talking about the small man. So the small man is potentially all of us, right? When we are sort of create these boxes for ourselves. This is how it is, this is how I live my life, kind of controlling or all the things that we can do. And when I'm in that space, I tend to be controlling and create boxes for everybody else in my life too, you know, without realizing it, of course. But the next line is about the sage. So the sage has to duck his head when the moon is low. What is that metaphor? 
feel. He's so, he's so grand, so tall. Yes, he's so grand, he's so expansive. He's so liberated, so big, that he has to duck his head when the moon is low. And it's this beautiful analogy because when you're that liberated and expansive, then you want everybody to be. So it ends with this beautiful symbolism of the keys, that you start wanting to give keys to all the people in your life because you want them to be liberated and expansive as well. And I, it's cute because I kind of see this in yoga sometimes when people fall in love with yoga and it begins to transform their lives. They want everybody to do it in their lives. You want your parents and you want your children and you want your spouse, and you want everyone to do yoga because it's so, it is so that thing that liberates you, you know, that you feel good about. So, um, you know, I, I've said this a lot as well, but you know, if, if someone ever wanted to give me a beautiful compliment and they said, you know, Diana, your mind is so beautiful. Uh, to me, it's like one of the greatest compliments I could ever receive. And I think that's what we're doing on our mats. Every time we come to our mats, we're trying to make this a beautiful place for us to reside. You know, and in me making this a beautiful place, I automatically bring it out into in all the aspects of my life. So I'm going to finish with the um, quote for this week, which is, again, one of my favorites. Uh, it's taken from the uh, Mahabharata smaller book, the Bhagavad Gita classic. And uh, this goes with our Manamai Kosha. For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, his very mind will be his greatest enemy. So we all have had days where our mind was our total enemy. <laughs> so the practice of yoga is really meant to be the thing that helps us befriend our mind and always kind of make those choices around that. So this week, I know it's a holiday week and you guys are busy. It's easy for us to get stressed and all those things. Just be the observer of your mind this week and see what beautiful places you can train your mind to go.